Habakkuk chapter 3. We finished last week the main portion of this prayer or psalm of Habakkuk, uh, where at the beginning he asked God that in his wrath, please remember mercy. Because in chapter 2, God's response to why aren't you intervening is, I see what's going on and I'm going to deliver judgment, I'm going to deliver wrath in my time according to my purpose. But he, according to chapter 2, verse 20, is in his holy temple. And so it will be rectified one day in the future of Habakkuk. In fact, not too far future from Habakkuk, as God's going to send the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. This uh, strikes fear into the heart of Habakkuk in verse 2 of chapter 3. He prays that he would remember mercy so that the faithful can be saved. And of course they will. Um, and he goes on to describe in this prophetic psalm, uh, the events of what God will do. Now, he writes about it in the past tense, so many people think he's only talking about Moses and what God had already done. But we saw, studying through it last week and the week before, there are things in here that God did not do before with Moses and Israel and bringing them out of, the, uh, of Egypt in the wilderness. And so, uh, we also saw cross-references to the future, to Revelation, and future prophecies. So, this is not only a reference to the past, but a pr prophecy of the future coming of the Lord and the work he will do. And that work he will do is a work of judgment, a, a work um, that is uh, called strange in Isaiah, uh, but it's a work that he will come to bring justice to the world. At the same time, however, bringing justice to the world for Israel means salvation, for faithful Israel. Uh, bringing justice to those who are righteous, and I know we, we understand there's none righteous, but to those who've been uh, unjustly treated, Right? Justice is a good thing. right? And so to Israel, that's the case. And to Habakkuk here as well, he was the one that was crying out for the judgment. Okay? But now that he's heard about the judgment and actually what it was, he's shaking in his boots. And that's why in verse 16, he says, When I heard my belly trembled. When he heard what? Of coming judgment. He feared. That's what happened. Uh, in the same way that when you read the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, the audience of the book of Hebrews, which is also the faithful remnant of Israel. In Hebrews 12, verse 12, it talks about the fear that they have of the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 21, it says, So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. It referring back to Moses when he saw God coming on Mount Sinai. Uh, down in verse 29 of chapter 12 of Hebrews, it says, Our God is a consuming fire. So these statements in Hebrews engender in the remnant of the Hebrews here in, in this New Testament book uh, a fear of the Lord because they understand he's a God of justice and a consuming fire. Okay, So we will see at the first point of our outline tonight, I want to reiterate the connection between Habakkuk and Hebrews. Habakkuk 3.16, let's read the verses here. When I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Well, that seems kind of contradictory. If you're shaken in your boots, how in the world are you going to find rest? Well, the fear here is because of what he's heard about what God is going to do. This is a terrifying thing. And uh, terror uh, and understanding the fear of the Lord is, can be a good thing in the sense of Israel in that it will get you in the right place. Right? Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so when you're fearing the coming judgment, you're trying to find a way to escape. And of course, God always provides that sort of way, and that way is faith, faith, uh, faith toward him, which he learned in chapter 2. Okay, So um, in verse 16 here, he says, "...that I might find rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops." In verse 16, notice when it says, "...that I might find rest in the day of trouble." Now, Habakkuk's living in a day of sin, right? a time of sin. So in this sense, there's trouble all around, but... It's not trouble in the sense that God's not judging anyone at the time Habakkuk wrote. That's why he's asking, how long until you judge, right? Uh, when he hears about the judgment, he calls that the day of trouble. Like when you read Revelation, right? The things described there, the great tribulation, greater than ever before, ever will be, um, that's a time of trouble. And Jer uh, Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, right? And so this day of trouble, he's referring to this time of coming judgment, uh, Hebrews deals with the same thing, as we'll deal with here in a second, coming tribulation, coming, the coming tribulation for, for, to the world. Okay? Uh, this rest that he's going to find in the day of trouble is the rest that the faithful remnant find and that Hebrews talks about in that book. Habakkuk is a part of the faithful remnant, 
uh, and he's the one that cried in, a, in the middle of a wicked generation, how long? Uh, God's response to Habakkuk was what? Soon. How long? God said, soon. He says, in fact, in chapter 1, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. As I speak, I'm raising them up, right? Soon. The end is near. But first, chapter 2, tribulation and judgment. Salvation will come after I bring judgment, is what essentially God is saying to Habakkuk, right? Now, Jesus' message when he came in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John <clears throat> to Israel, uh, he came and his message was, the kingdom is at hand. Mark 1, 14, the gospel of the kingdom, which was salvation for Israel. The kingdom, justice, righteousness on the earth is at hand. That's what Jesus preached, Right? Now, of course, we look around today and we don't see the righteousness that God is, that is worthy of God on the planet. We don't see uh, the type of justice that God would bring on the planet. But Jesus came 2,000 years ago preaching the kingdom is at hand. But then he started preaching in Matthew 24 and other places, judgment. You ever think about that? Jesus came and he, he came to preach forgiveness and he came to, to preach the kingdom at hand. But throughout his message was judgment on those that don't believe, right? He was saying, the kingdom will come, but first, judgment. Matthew 24, 21 is, a, and if you want to stay and uh, put a bookmark on Matthew, it may be helpful for tonight, as we'll go back there quite a few times. <clears throat> Jesus spoke more about hell and judgment and uh, that sort of thing than uh, almost any other writer of the New Testament. Uh, Paul speaks quite a bit about it as well. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 21. And 25. There we go. Then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's pretty much a summary of Habakkuk chapter 2, right? Or Habakkuk 3, uh, however you want to read that. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 17, Peter being a part of the ministry of Jesus' earthly ministry, being those 12, uh, one of the 12 apostles that Jesus chose, he writes about the time of judgment being at the time he wrote the book. 1 Peter 4, 17. The time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? That sounds like Habakkuk once again, right? Habakkuk saying is how long, right? God tells Habakkuk, soon, judgment's coming, right? And Habakkuk now is fearful because he's going to have to live through this fire, right? And first Peter's in the same situation, same context, where he's, the Lord Jesus has, has left. He said he'll return, and when he returns, he'll return in judgment, right? And so he's waiting for him to return in judgment, and he says the time of judgment is come, right? Well, again, we think of what Peter said there compared to the dispensation in which we live. Well, judgment is not now. Now is the dispensation of grace, you see. So you see how Peter and the 12 apostles and Jesus and his earthly ministry are in a similar context to Habakkuk. Judgment is on the brink, it's at the door, and God is going to come and bring his judge, and then salvation comes after that. Right? They're waiting for this. So the parallels then between Habakkuk and Hebrews, or the Hebrew epistles, the epistles of the 12 apostles, Peter, James, John, Jude, right, are very similar. Uh, on the back of your outline there, I listed 12 uh, Ways in which they're similar, the number being intended, 12 tribes of Israel and all. Uh, I'm sure there are many more. Uh, both books, Habakkuk and Hebrews, describe Israel's failure. Remember Habakkuk 1 verse 4, uh, Habakkuk was complaining about his own wicked generation, the nation of Israel. He was complaining about the, the Gentile pagans, about his own country. Right? He says there's injustice in our country, God. When are we going to set things right? And the same thing happens in Hebrews 3, 17 through 19, in Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, where it condemns unfaithful Israel. Hebrews 3.17 says, But with whom was he grieved forty years in the wilderness? Well, with unfaithful Israel. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. He's talking in Hebrews 3 and 4 here about those in Israel, the Hebrews, who do not Believe. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. That's a direct quote from Habakkuk chapter 2. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Well, who's them that draw back? They used to be close, but they drew back. Well, who's that? That's Israel that's fallen away. Gentiles were never close, remember. Okay, so you see both books describing Israel's failure, and that's kind of implicit in the books. You see both books written during the last days of Israel. 
Habakkuk 1 6. God says back there that I'm raising up the Chaldeans. Judgment's coming soon, right? And Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. We've covered the chart before how at that time uh, uh, Israel is going to be taken away. And perhaps I should redraw this just for dispensational context here. You had uh, Judah and Jerusalem in their land. And Habakkuk is written at this time. There's Habakkuk written right here. And what's about to happen is these people are going to be taken away. They're going to be scattered by the Babylonians and taken captive, taken out of the land, the city destroyed. It's not till hundreds of years in the future that they come back to the land, and that not a result of God, but simply uh, the, the history of the pagans letting them to come back um, and, and God helping that remnant build the city there, that when Jesus comes, he comes to the Israel in the land, and he preaches judgment, the tribulation, and then the kingdom. Okay? And so you have here where Hebrews is written. Right? And you're going to have this similar, similar thing happen. Jerusalem is in the city, but judgment's about to come on them. Jesus came, and they're in the city, and he's saying, judgment's about to come on you. That's what Hebrews is talking about. Okay? And so we see in, in Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, the author of Hebrews says this, that in time past, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. What's he called these times in which this author is living? The last days. Right? Now, that was 2,000 years ago. Right? They call it the last days. So Hebrews is a last days book. It's talking about the last days and the world, the kingdom to come. Both books identify unfaithful Israel. Habakkuk 1, of course, talks about their unbelief. And Hebrews, thin, we've, Hebrews 3 already covered um, uh, unfaithful Israel and their identification there. Uh, both speak of, of being open to the perfect judge. Um, of all things being open to the perfect judge. Look at Hebrews 4, verse 12. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You've read that in bookmarks, right? But it, this verse is written in the context that God is the judge. And the word of God is quick and powerful, piercing to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's a terrifying passage. Okay? We quoted about the Bible and saying, oh, the Bible is the word of God. Well, this is true. And the Bible is powerful. Yes, it's true. And it's a living book. Yes, it is. Uh, but it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And we kind of think, oh, yeah, we're the one holding it. Really? Jesus came and said, you know, you'll be judged by your words and my words. The word of God will judge you, right? Uh, this book judges people. Again, praise God for his grace today. But we saw that back in Habakkuk last week about the sword of God coming and judge the people, right? Uh, this is the word of God. Jesus coming back with a sword out of his mouth, going to be judging the people. That's what Hebrews is talking about. That's why verse 13 says there's nothing hidden. Uh, there's not any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Everything is naked and open. Well, that's Habakkuk 2, right? Habakkuk 2, where we covered that, and Habakkuk's questioning God's uh, method of justice, and he's going, Habakkuk, I see everything. And I see your wickedness and everyone's wickedness, which is why he's trembling in chapter 3. Okay, but uh, you see both books kind of emphasizing this idea that uh, the law brings the knowledge of sin, and that we're all sinners. Uh, both speak of coming judgment. That's Habakkuk 2 and Habakkuk, or Hebrews 12, verse 25. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth. He Hebrews 12 is comparing what God did and spoke through Moses on Mount Sinai when Moses trembled and shook because there was earthquakes and lightning when God came down and gave the law to Jesus in Mount Zion. Okay? Now, most people make that comparison to say, well, Moses, the Old Testament, that's scary and the law is scary and there's earthquakes and lightning. And Jesus, he comes with a hand of love, right? But Hebrews is not writing it that way. 
You can find about the love of God, that commends God, uh, that, that, that God's committed love in Romans 5, verse 8, according to grace. But Hebrews 12, uh, what's happening here on Mount Zion is even more worse than what was happening on Mount Sinai. Okay? That's why he keeps making the comparison, saying it was terrible back then. But verse 22 says, you are coming to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels. This is supposed to make it more weighty, right? To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to, the God, uh, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. And so he's talking about if you can't escape the judgment of the old, what makes you think you're going to escape the judgment of the new? It ends the chapter with our God is a consuming fire, you see, which is a terrifying thought. And so you see the, the emphasis here, the theme. Both speak of the importance of faith. Obviously, if everything is naked and open to the eyes of the perfect judge and God's a consuming fire and consumes all that which is imperfect and sinful, then who will survive, as Job asked, right? Uh, how can man be justified? Well, both books emphasize faith. Habakkuk 2, that's how he starts with the vision. He says the just shall live by his faith. And he goes on to describe how sinful everyone is and deserving of judgment, right? And then Hebrews, uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated to this in Hebrews chapter 11, right? Hebrews 10, 38 says that now the just shall live by faith, quoting Habakkuk 2, and then it goes on for a whole chapter in Hebrews 11, describing how, what faith is, and how all of Israel's fathers and ancestors walked by faith, at least the faithful remnant, which it identifies here, all these people, by faith they did this, by faith they did this, by faith they did this. Faith being the necessary thing when everything's open uh, to the, the eyes of the, the perfect judge. Okay, Both are written to a remnant Asking a, a, a rune of Israel who are asking how long to the judgment. Back in 1 2, it's written in black and white there. He says, How long? But also in Hebrews, you have people who are waiting for this, com this restitution of all things. Acts 3 talks about this, and yet it hasn't come yet. And so the author of Hebrews is explaining that even though you are out of the city and it looks like you're being persecuted, which you are, um, God will bring judgment and the city he promised you. Right? So they're waiting for this. Salvation. How long, God, until you return? That's what they were asking, wasn't it? When Jesus left, they were asking constantly, how long are you until you come back? Right? Because when he came back, that's when the show really got started, according to Israel's program. Until then, they're waiting, living in a wicked generation. Right? Again, the difference between that and this dispensation. Do we want the Lord to return? Yes. But there's actually something God is doing today, which is giving grace to all men freely through Christ's finished work. And so the longer he stays away today is actually the more opportunity people have to be saved. That wasn't the case when Habakkuk and Hebrews, where salvation comes when Christ returns or God comes in judgment, right? Then salvation, right? Very different. So both books require endurance. Hebrews 3.14 says this specifically. Habakkuk has to wait, right? How long? He says soon, but you're going to have to wait. Hebrews 3.14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, Hebrews 3.14. Right? Do you see how the partaking of Christ in Hebrews 3.14 is conditional upon their steadfast confidence unto the end? You say, what's the end? Well, make it the end of your life. Make it the end of when Christ returns. Either way, there's a condition upon you partaking of Christ. The difference between that and today is that you partake of Christ when you believe the gospel, not based on any condition of how long you endure. Right? It's nothing about you and what you do in the future. It's what Christ did in the past for you. That's a different type of situation. But Habakkuk is in that situation. God says, I'll bring judgment, and you better hope you're part of the faithful. You know, just live by faith. Right? And so this is why Habakkuk says uh, he was trembling, um, that he might have rest in that day, because he wants to walk by faith. Right? And how will he know if his walk by faith worked at the end? Right? That's how they know. How do you know if your faith is working? And don't say, by my fruit. You know your faith is working. Your faith is in, what is your faith in? It's in Christ and his finished work. So you know your faith is working if Christ did all the work to save you. Did he? Yes. And if you say yes, then that's your faith working. The only way your faith today would not work is if Christ did not die for your sins, he did not raise from the dead, right? Then your faith would be in vain, right? Anyway, we'll move on here. Both speak of uh, in, in finding rest. We saw in the verse we just read in Habakkuk 3.16, he wants to find rest in the day of trouble. 
in the day of tribulation, right? It was to find rest. Well, there's, a, again, a whole chapter in Hebrews, Hebrews 4, dealing with the audience of Hebrews finding rest in the day of trouble. Just like Israel in the wilderness, who was living through the wilderness, a time of lesser trouble, but trouble for Israel, and their rest would be in the promised land. Well, Hebrews 4 says, that's where you're at right now, guys, speaking to the faithful remnant of Israel. Uh, you guys are scattered out of the land. You're not holding the positions in the land, uh, but you're like those people in the wilderness. Based on a little time of persecution here, you're going to face some trouble, but if you endure to the end, you will find the rest of the kingdom of the promised land. We find our rest in Christ's finished work. He did it all. That's our rest. We rest in him. That's all. Okay, we're not promised an earthly land or an earthly position. Both speak about the remnant of Israel waiting for salvation, which we dealt with already. Uh, Habakkuk 1 2 mentions his, uh, his desire to be saved uh, by God's hand. And then Hebrews 9 28 also talks about Christ coming back again the second time unto salvation. So Hebrews 9 28, remember the first time he came to die, and Hebrews 9 28 says he'll come again unto salvation. Now you and I look back to salvation as Christ, uh, we understand what Christ did on the cross. The author of Hebrews 9.28, though he explains the cross, says their salvation doesn't come into the future. Both books exhort the remnant to fear. We saw already in Habakkuk 3, verse 2 and 16, how he was afraid because of God's vision. And Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 10, Hebrews 11, talk about the fear uh, that, uh, that the faithful have, the fear of the Lord. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. He told Noah, I'm going to flood the world. Okay. You think he was like, oh, great. It's going to be a fun time. You know, water slides. No, it, it, judgment. Everyone's going to die. A fearful thing. And Noah's thinking, how am I going to live? Now, of course, we, we, we exegete and say, well, Noah was a man of faith. And so he built the ark. So he knew he was going to live because he believed God in the boat. But I mean, what would you think? If you trusted God, he's not going to flood the whole planet. And the only thing floating on top of this water is you in a boat. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much of a, a seaman Noah was before the ark. You know, it's a fearful thing to hear about God's judgment, everyone else dying, and you being saved by trusting something you've never seen work before. Huh? And so you have fear there in Hebrews 11, verse 7. Same thing with Habakkuk, right? Trusting God to save um, before this judgment comes. So you see as the themes here, both of these books, uh, faith, fear, a future, hope, rest in the Lord. So you see the similarities there have a lot of things in common. So uh, I thought that's worthy of your attention to notice the connections there. Let's uh, move on to Habakkuk 3, verse 17. 3, 17. This verse here, filled with prophetic, oh, I like the word pregnant. It's pregnant with prophetic meaning. Just waiting to be delivered from its uh, verse here. It says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fall or fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and will make me to walk upon mine hind places. That's how he finishes his his psalm. A position of hope, position of renewed faith, right? And so this is where Habakkuk's at. He wants to be the just that walked by faith, was faith, right? But what's he say in this comparison? Although the fig tree doesn't blossom, the fruit of the vines don't blossom, right? The olive trees fail, the fields fail, the flocks cut off, there's no herds. Well, this is not a good time of economic prosperity. That's what we know immediately. Is when the covenant, when God promised to Israel that if you obey my covenant, then I will, what, make your fruit increase and make your animals increase and things will just increase Pro physical prosperity of of their income of the things that they had um on, on, in the land well here is the time habakkuk's living in not prosperity because they're disobeying god's covenant so we know that immediately just by reading the verse superficially just as it's written but each of these things that habakkuk talks about the fig tree the vineyard the olive tree the flock all refer to Israel. And I know that because this isn't the only verse in the Bible talking about it. And we can spend a whole two or three lessons talking about these things. I'll try not to do that. This is the last lesson of Habakkuk.
But each of these events occur in the Messianic ministry to Israel. When back in Habakkuk says, though the olive tree fails and the vineyard fails to bear fruit and the, and the fig tree fails and the flock is scattered, those things occur not only here when Israel's destroyed and scattered, but Jesus speaks about them here in his earthly ministry. Do you recall any of your readings and lessons in Jesus' ministry, him talking about failing fig trees and him coming to vineyards and there being no fruit and him talking about you'll know them by their fruit and there's no fruit over there, right? And him talking about little flocks and dividing the sheep and the sheep hear my voice. You don't know me because you're not my sheep. You don't hear my voice. And, and, and so all of this comes to fruition in Jesus' ministry. The same context of Habakkuk. Now, I'm not talking about the same time, right? The same context of impending judgment, Israel being in disobedience, being in corruption, being in faithlessness, right? That was the situation here as well. That's why Hebrews has this connection to Habakkuk, written about the same type of situation, okay? So let's cover some of this. It's a very interesting study. Trees in Scripture, first of all, represent nations. Power, provision, authorities, you know, governments, nations, Right? You know this from quite a few passages. I'll just give you uh, one here, one or two. Ezekiel chapter 3, for example. You'll see that when God, or 31, excuse me, Ezekiel 31. Oftentimes when God speaks about the power of nations or the blessings that they provide, or provision they provide to people, um, he, he uses trees as a metaphor. Ezekiel 31 Verse 1, it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third month, let's skip to verse 2. Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar. A cedar is a tree. The Assyrian was a cedar tree in Lebanon with fair branches, with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature. His top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running around about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied. His branches became long because of the multitude of waters. When he shot forth, all the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. You see, what's this talking about? This, this kingdom, this nation, this dominion here, was so great that all the nations bowed underneath it, right? Well, this Assyrian, of course, and Ezekiel is talking about that empire, right? Cyrus and all this. Um, verse 7, thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. By the way, don't have time to get into it, but this, this Assyrian, not only speaking about those empires during the time of Israel's captivity here, prophetic of the Antichrist, right? The rule of the nations. He was fair in his greatness, his, the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his bows, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. But the Assyrian is not of God. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Um, it, Ezekiel also talks about the devil and how beautiful he was. And how much power he had. Anyway, just one example. Daniel 4 talks about, uh, in Daniel 4, many dreams where Nebuchadnezzar and his empire, his kingdom, his dominion, is referred to as a tree. In Daniel 4, you can go back and read that. And he had this dream of a giant tree and all the birds were in the branches. And Daniel says, well, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. That's your dominion. But the dream also said the tree was cut down to the root and to the stump. And Daniel said, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. Your kingdom is going to be destroyed. So the, the tree is representing nations, kingdoms, dominions, powers. And so in prophecy, when it's talking about Israel, quite often God refers to Israel as a tree or trees, right? And so Israel is described as different trees. And these different trees, if you want to study uh, perhaps a little bit past the surface there, uh, refer to different aspects of Israel or different things in Israel. Look at James 3 verse 12. There's a reason why specific trees are named. And it's not just because, the, although it's included, it's not just because those are the trees that happen to be in the, the Middle East. That's true in part, right? But it's also true that when God speaks about specific trees, there's a meaning given to these specific trees based on the qualities that God created them with. James 3, verse 12, James says, Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Answer, no either a vine figs 
Can the vine produce figs? No. So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now, of course, the, the, the practical teaching here is evident in James that, you know, uh, you can't have one thing and, and produce another kind of fruit. Um, and so it's talking there about the, the mouth and their speech and that sort of thing. But it's interesting. He uses the fig tree doesn't produce olive berries and the vine doesn't produce figs. A vine, a fig, an olive tree. These three trees come up over and over again in Israel's history, prophetically. They come up in Jesus' ministry and they come up again in the kingdom. Okay. What do these trees mean? Well, here's something for your consideration. And I've done some reading and some study on this, and I don't pretend to think that this is the, the end-all, be-all dogmatic truth. But I think it's very interesting, and perhaps you'll be uh, persuaded of it as well, or at least uh, spark your interest in some sort of a consideration. Nothing we're going to put in our statement of faith and close off relationship with you if you disagree with me on which tree means what. But it's kind of fun to study. Uh, the fig tree, uh, according to what I've been studying uh, and looking at the references of the fig in the Scripture, is going to be referring to the religion of Israel, okay? The religion, as opposed to the political nation of Israel. See, there's a difference. There's the religious Israel, then there's the political nation of Israel with the kings, then there's the religion, which concerns uh, the, the law that God gave them, right? Uh, and then there's the, uh, the olive tree. So the vineyard is going to refer to that nation, the governmental nation, and the olive tree is going to refer to the spiritual Israel, the aspect of Israel that requires spiritual fruit. Okay, we'll, we'll see that in a bit. So the fig tree is going to bear the fruit of figs, and so the religion of Israel is supposed to produce what? When God gave the law to Israel, it's supposed to produce obedience, good works, right? Here's the law. Do it. What if they don't? Well, they're not bearing the fruit that the tree is supposed to bear, or supposed to produce, right? It's good works. Look at James 1.27. James 1.27, it describes in the book of James, not a coincidence written to the 12 tribes of Israel, talking about works when it talks about pure religion. James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, in case you didn't know how to judge one fruit from another. Pure religion is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion. Right? Good works, good deeds, right there. There it is. And you can study the fathers and the widows being one of the ultimate cases of those good deeds under the law. By the way, that is how the law taught mercy. It's because under the law, you, you had no obligation to uh, another person's family. You had your own, right? You had an obligation to that, but not to others. But the law taught charity and mercy to the fatherless, those who didn't have a father to provide, and the widows didn't have a husband to provide. It's the law taught mercy. Pure religion, good works stem from mercy and love, right? Which is what the law is supposed to teach. What did Jesus say when he was asked, what's the chief commandment? Love God, love your neighbor, right? Pure religion. That's what that is. Pure religion. Now, what, just stepping back from that context, what do we know about good works? We can't do them. They're good. They're definitely good. But we can't do them. We need God's grace. We as humanity can't do them. Loving God is the chief commandment. Uh, unfortunately, we don't do that all the time. Right? Because there's sin in us. So we need God's grace. But that is not, not in the issue right now. The fig tree refers to Israel's religion, their law. Look at John 1. You see the fig tree again and again referring to the good works Israel, a true Israelite, is supposed to perform. And in John, when Jesus comes, remember when he saw Nathanael? Remember? A man, an Israelite in whom was no guile. Remember that in John 1? What tree did he see him sitting under? Do you remember? In John 1, down in verse 48, or 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Right? A true Israelite right there. He said, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. You say, coincidence. There's lots of fig trees in Israel. Yes, true. But this is God's inspired word. And you keep finding these instances of fig trees referring to people's good works, and you're going, hmm. And when Habakkuk 3 and other places talks about a fig tree bearing no fruit, you're going, well, apparently, that's referring to Israel's religion. Okay. We'll see that in a bit here. Oh, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah 5. 
the, vin the vine. This is grapes, right? The vineyard, the vine. Who is the vineyard in the scripture? You say it's a church that makes CDs of lousy worship music. No. The vineyard is described in the Bible as Israel. And so any church that calls themselves vineyard is going to have a doctrine that they are Israel, or at least neglect the, the, the need to rightly divide the scriptures and be singing songs about themselves or refer to Israel. Because they're calling themselves the vineyard, which in the Bible is only in reference to Israel. Isaiah 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved with a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof. Now, I'm just reading this, but you can imagine uh, that lights turn dark and the spotlight on the stage and me having long hair and being female and singing some song. Um, in verse 2, And built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. He looked that it should bring forth grapes, which is what vine vineyards do. They produce grapes, right? And it brought forth wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Why did it do that? And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof and shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof. It shall be trodden down. So God plants this vineyard, does everything that's necessary for this vineyard to produce good fruit. And it doesn't. So what's the only logical thing you should do? Start over. Destroy it and plant another one. Right? And he says in verse 6, I'll lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. It says it right there in Isaiah 5 verse 7. The vineyard is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. You see, God created Israel, planted them and gave them everything they needed. Judges, prophets, kings, the law, right? Give them everything that they would produce good fruit, which in the vineyard refers to a kingdom on the planet to bless the world. God said, in you will be a nation that will bless the nations of the world. Did Israel do this? No. Planted a vineyard, did everything he did uh, that was necessary for it to grow into a blessing for the world, and they didn't. Right? And so he says, Judgment's going to come in the house of Israel. He says in verse 7, But behold, oppression, or in verse 7, he says, He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now, early on, he said he was looking for grapes, but of course, that's a metaphor. What are the grapes in verse 7? Judgment and righteousness, right? How do judgment and righteousness get established in a society? By the law, by the government, by the national institution there. God gives the law. Look at verse uh, 24 in this chapter. They have 524. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust. That's exactly what Habakkuk said, didn't it? The blossom of the vineyard, it won't be there, right? Why is it not there? Well, it's not bearing fruit because they're not operating according to God's instructions, but God's also going to judge them. It says, because they have cast away, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. You see? So what makes the vineyard get established? What makes the nation produce judgment and righteousness when they establish his law? What did Jesus speak about when he came to his earthly ministry? All right? You speak about the law, right? But you're not actually doing it. Right? Well, we'll get there in a moment. The vineyard refers to the nation that produces judgment and righteousness. Look at the olive tree. Leviticus 24, verse 2. What does an olive tree produce? You say, olives for my pickle loaf sandwich. No, uh, olives that you squeeze oil out of that produces light. Right? You say, well, I don't make light on my oil, but Israel did. They were commanded in Leviticus 24 to put a, a lamp in the temple... And this lamp, Leviticus 24, verse 2, was to, to uh, always be lit, never go out. Leviticus 24, 2. Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. You, we did a study on Hanukkah, I think, last December. You can go back and study more about that. And Hanukkah has to do with the lights and the lamp being lit continually and all this sort of thing. But uh, they needed olive oil for that. That's how the lamp was lit continually. They didn't have a plug-in for electricity. That, it was olive oil. Right? 
So in the scripture, when it talks about this olive oil, it's constantly referring to this light or in other places, this faith, this trust, this spiritual part of Israel that they will trust the Lord who is their light. Right. This is what it talks about. You say, well, I hear you saying that, but where's the scripture with it? Look at Psalm 52. Study about the olive tree and you'll find that um, the olive tree refers to the light that's given to Israel by God as we saw in Leviticus 2. And when people call themselves an olive tree, like in Psalm 52, they're referring to the trust in God's word, the light he gives, despite what they see around them. Psalm 52, verse 7. David writes, Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I... I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. Why are you like a green olive tree, David? I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. This man over here trusts in his riches and trusts in his own wickedness, right? But I trust in God. I'm like an olive tree. So apparently, being like an olive tree in Psalm 52 is trusting in God with the light he's given, right? That's what olive, olive trees do, they produce light. And it says, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. I will not trust in my riches or my wickedness. And all throughout the Old Testament, you find men who trust in their riches, and prophecies are always against them, okay, and they trust in their own riches and their own wickedness. Hosea 14 is another place we can look for this. Hosea 14. Now, Hosea 14 is what Israel will one day say to God about their sins. It's what they should have said when God offered them the law, uh, though they couldn't understand the point of the law at the point, at that point in, in history, but um, it, looking in hindsight, this is what they should have said, right? Hosea 14, verse 1. O Israel, return to the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. You see what it says to say? Don't say, oh, don't worry, God, we'll do better next time. It says, say this, forgive us our sins, take away our iniquity, and receive us graciously. You've got to receive us graciously because we can't do better. That's the point. Isaiah 14, 2 says, Israel, you need to tell God to show you grace because <laughs> the only way you're going to come back right, is by God's grace. So you see here another instance of grace in the Bible it doesn't explain how God can be gracious at all, just that he needs to be for Israel to return. But verse 3, Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods, talking about the works of their own hands, right? For in thee the fatherless finds mercy. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them. I will be as the dew unto Israel, and shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. Why is it like the olive tree here? Because they're finally saying, by grace through faith, God, you've got to receive us graciously. We'll trust you, not ourselves. Right? Receive us graciously. That's the olive tree. Right? So you have the fig tree that's supposed to say good works and mercy and love. You have the vineyard that's supposed to establish righteousness and judgment on the earth. And you have this olive tree that's supposed to trust God no matter what. Right? And the light he gives, not their own hands, not their own riches or anything else. This is what Israel is supposed to represent to the world. And God gave them every opportunity and every privilege to be able to do this. <clears throat> the problem, of course, was sin. It wasn't a problem for God, but that was man's problem, was sin. Sin was the hindrance there. When Jesus came to Israel, moving forward to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <clears throat> this is all prophecy back here. When Jesus came to Israel, we find that he was looking for fruit on these trees. And when Jesus came to Israel, he came to his own, and his own received him not. And he comes, yes, as the Savior, but his presence is going to also establish a point of judgment against this nation, because he's going to come to evaluate. He's going to come and say, where's the fruit here? There's going to be no mercy, no love, no obedience. There's going to be no national justice and righteousness. There's going to be no faith. Right? All the trees are barren. And because of this, they're going to be cut down. That's what Jesus says. They'll be cut down. John the Baptist even says that. Look at Matthew 3. <clears throat> Matthew 3. Remember John the Baptist when he was preaching water baptism of repentance for the remission of sins? Matthew 3, verse 8. 
He says to the Pharisees and Sadducees, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So John the Baptist preached coming wrath in Matthew 3, verse uh, 7. Okay, who, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Now you see that word fruits, you're going, yeah, fruits, I get it. You know, a plant produces fruit. But did you know there's been centuries of prophecies about trees and the fruit they were supposed to produce? There had been, right? <clears throat> Bring, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. One of the fruits may be like the olive tree, right? If you can't do the work, at least say, I trust God, you've got to receive me graciously. That'd be an olive tree fruit, right? Or do the works that you said you would do under the law. That'd be the fig tree fruit, right? Or at least cry out for justice, as John the Baptist was, which is the vineyard fruit, right? But they weren't. Bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That was John the Baptist's message. If you do not come and get water baptized of repentance, which means that you had to bear the fruit of repentance, right? If you didn't come and do that, then an axe is at the tree, John the Baptist says. The axe has been picked up. It's ready to hew you down. And he's not he is speaking metaphorically, but there's so much prophecy behind that, that statement. He's not the first one to say that. Jeremiah prophesied it. Ezekiel prophesied it. Habakkuk prophesied it. All the prophets spoke of this. John the Baptist is just saying, now's the time, folks. There's no time after this. Now's the time. Because the one that comes after me, he's the one that holds the axe. Right? So you see, he's knocking at the door. He's going to knock you down. Unless you believe. Unless you repent. Get water baptized. Get your sins remitted. Meanwhile, you see um, this issue of the trees here. So let's look at the fig tree. Look at Mark 11. <clears throat> Jesus comes and evaluates the fig tree. Mark 11. In verse 13, <clears throat> Mark 11 is the scenario where Jesus uh, rides into Jerusalem on the colt. Remember, rides in Jerusalem and they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? And the, and the leaves are putting down on the ground, right? Um, and this is the situation where when they're crying Hosanna, Jesus comes to the temple and the Pharisees and the scribes are displeased at this. They turn to Jesus and say, do you know what they're saying about you? They say it as a condemnation, right? They're calling him the Messiah. And the scribes and priests turn to Jesus and say, you need to stop this. If you call yourself a rabbi, you need to stop this because it's blasphemy is what the priests and, and the scribes are saying. Jesus, of course, is the Messiah. And so it wasn't, you know, the people that were wrong. It was the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. Mark 11, this is where we find our context in verse 12, where on the morrow when they were come to Bethany, he was hungry. And so he went in Jerusalem the first time, and the priests rejected him. He goes back out and comes in in the morning again, and he saw a fig tree afar off having leaves. He came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. But the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And you read this as a Christian and going, What in the world? Jesus hates trees. Right? He's not even patient to wait for the fruit to come. Well, he's been, God has been patient for centuries, waiting for the fruit to come. They came to Jerusalem. Jesus went to the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Why did he do that? So he had a bad morning. There was no figs on the tree. <laughs> yeah, but what's the fig tree talk about? It's Israel's religion. And where does he go right after he curses that fig tree? To the center of Israel's religion and turns over the tables saying, this isn't working. What you're doing isn't working. These aren't good works. This isn't mercy and love. You're selling sacrifices and that a usury when this should have been a house of prayer where people came to have mercy, right? In fact, he said elsewhere, he said mercy was greater than sacrifice. He's overturning these tables, right? <clears throat> and he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. He taught, saying unto them, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves, the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. <clears throat> they went out of the city in verse 20 in the morning. As they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith to them, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answered, saith unto him, have, have faith in God. 
Why do you say have faith in God? That's how you produce fruit, right? I've cursed the fig tree. I came, I came to find fruit on the fig tree. It didn't have fruit. I cursed it. I went to the temple and cursed that. And then Peter says, hey, look, fig tree. You cursed it. And it's cursed. He goes, Peter, have faith. He knows he doesn't understand what's going on at this moment, but he says have faith in God. Because when you have faith, you will produce the fruits needed, right? <clears throat> the fig tree was corrupt in Israel. Look at Luke 13. About the vine. You see Jesus talking about the vine over and over again in his parables. There was a man that leased out his vineyard, a man that told other people to watch his vineyard, and what happened? They didn't. Right? Luke 13, verse 6. <coughs> he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years... I come seeking fruit on his fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it to the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let alone this one year, this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. <clears throat> what in the world does that parable mean? The tree's not bearing fruit. The Lord says cut it down. And someone comes and say, leave it alone one year. And if it doesn't bear fruit, you can cut it down. Right? The vineyard, the nation of Israel, is going to be destroyed. And the parable here is wait a little bit longer, right? And God did. On the cross, when they crucified the Lord, Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do. And God was offering Israel their kingdom for some seven chapters in the book of Acts, up to a year before they stoned Stephen. The nation of Israel being entirely <clears throat> in rejection of, of God and his servants. Look at Matthew 21. We'll go to the olive tree here in a moment, which is everyone's favorite tree, because Paul speaks about an olive tree in Romans 11. Matthew 21. <clears throat> the same context where he speaks about the barren fig tree. The Pharisees challenge him by what authority he does these things. And uh, they can't, uh, then he asks them the question, verse 25, I ask you a question first, by what authority did John the Baptist do the things he came to do? They couldn't answer him, of course, because they were afraid of people. And um, Jesus said, oh, I'm not going to tell you then, but I'll tell you this. In verse 28, what think you? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. He came to the second son, likewise, and he answered and said, I go. Sir, but he went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. You understand the parable, right? Two sons. One said, said I'm not going to do it. The other son said, I'm going to do it. The one who said, I'm not going to do it, actually went and did it. The son who said, I was going to do it, didn't do it. Which one did right? Well, obviously, the first son, even though he said he didn't, which was wrong, he actually did it in the end, right? <clears throat> and that's what they answer. They answer correctly. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily, truly, I say unto you, you got it right. The publicans and the harlots will go into the kingdom before you. What's he talking about? A vineyard? No, he's about the kingdom. The nation, the government, the kingdom of Israel. Who gets it? These priests and scribes and leaders? No. Harlots and publicans. No, he's not calling out industries here. Harlot, come into the kingdom. He's talking about people who were following him. Right? The people who were following him had been harlots and publicans, and they followed him and believed in him, and this will get the kingdom. Verse 32, <clears throat> uh, let's go to verse 33, rather. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, again a vineyard, and hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, that sounds like Isaiah 5, and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto him likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. The meaning is obvious when you understand Jesus is talking about himself being the son and the, the servants that God sent being the prophets, right? The vineyards, Israel. He led out the vineyard to the husband, people in charge of Israel, right? Priests, rulers, scribes. And he sent servants, prophets. And what the prophets say to the leaders of Israel? Repent. 
And then eventually he sent his son because they killed all the prophets. And what does his son say? Repent, the kingdom's at hand. And what are they going to do to him? Kill him. They haven't yet. But this is a parable. And he says, um, and they kill him. And then it says, they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? The Pharisees answered, he will mis miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits. I mean, obviously he chose wrongly. He should choose better employees, you know. <laughs> and they condemned themselves. Jesus said unto them, did you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? Verse 43, a crucial verse, Matthew 21. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Vineyard is a nation. It's national Israel. Who's in charge of the kingdom? Right? It's supposed to bring judgment and righteousness, and it's not coming by those who are in charge of Israel. And so Jesus says in his ministry, I'm taking it from you guys and giving it to a nation that actually bears the fruit of judgment and righteousness because they judged rightly that I'm the king. Right? Who are the people that follow him? Right? That's who these people are. And so they proceed in verse 45 that he, they thought he was talking about them, and of course he was. Right? We see the vineyard here, a fruitless nation that Jesus gives the vineyard responsibility, the vineyard to his followers, the remnant of Israel, the disciples. Right? The olive tree. Let's see where Jesus talks about the olive tree. The olive tree speaks about the spirit that produces faith and light. That's what it's supposed to be doing. Light continually in Israel. Where the world is dark, Israel will have a light continually shining. That's the olive oil, right? Fruit of the olive tree. But instead, Israel became a dark place, just like the world. And in John 8, verse 12, look here. <clears throat> then spake Jesus again unto them. What does that mean, that Jesus spake again? That means he spake before, right? Right? Which means when other Bible translations tell you verses 1 through 11 should not be in your Bible, they make verse 12 a mistake. And that's what they do. They say John 8, 1 through 11, it should not be part of inspired scripture. But the next verse they don't take out says he spake again. But taking up the place where he spoke the first time is a problem. But Jesus spake again and saith, what did he say? I am the light of the world. Popular bookmark verse, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You follow me. Jesus calls himself the vine in other places. Remember that? I am the vine. You are the branches. Right? He also says, I am the light of the world. You follow me. I continually provide light. I am the lampstand. I am the olive oil continually being produced. Right? And you need me to bear fruit. You need to have faith in the Messiah. To be the city on a hill shining light to the world. Right? That's the idea. Where, when did he speak again? Or speak the first time? Look up in verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Why is it called the Mount of Olives? There's olive trees everywhere. And on this olive tree, Jesus uh, early in the morning came into the temple and the people came unto him and sat down and taught him. And the scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman. This is the adulterous woman, remember? And so they bring this woman to him and says this woman was caught in the act of adultery and they want him to judge a righteous judgment. What are they missing? First, they don't believe he's the Messiah. That's why they're challenging him. Right? And secondly, they have no understanding of God's truth. God gave them the light of the law, which is, granted, not a, as great of a light as he has now given, but it was light. And they are totally walking in darkness. He says, you without sin cast the first stone. And this is, this is the instruction, right? And then he says, right after that, he spoke again and says, I am the light of the world. Do not try to cover me up, Right? You have to hear me, right? You have to believe me. You have to follow me is what he says. In John 9, in this same context, after, after 8, he goes on and on, talking about how they're of the devil, their father the devil, and his sheep know his voice and all that business. In John 9, he passes by and sees a blind man. What's he do to the blind man? He gives him sight. He's the light of the world, right? He is the fruit of the olive tree, the promised light that would shine continually to Israel, right? David said, I am a green olive tree because I trust God, right? 
And he says in Jeremiah 11 that uh, the olive tree of Israel will be destroyed because they had no trust in God. Jesus comes, looks at the olive tree and says, do you believe me in me? I am the light of the world. And they go, no, we don't. Right. Thus they're not bearing the fruit. Look at Luke 12, 32. Luke 12. Now what we're doing here is some Bible study. I hope it's kind of fun for you. We're comparing verses with verses to see how that everything Jesus did was prophesied before. And we can understand a lot of these things in Jesus' ministry by studying the Old Testament, literally. <clears throat> Luke 12, <clears throat> verse 52. Verse 51 says, Suppose ye that I came to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter. Right? He came to give division. But what is he dividing? You ever ask that? What is he dividing? He came to look at the trees in Israel. He's cutting off the dead branches and keeping the ones that bear fruit. You'll know them by their fruits is what he teaches. Look at Luke 12, 32. He's dividing his sheep from the wolves, right? Remember those parables? About the sheep and the wolves? In fact, that's, that's the same context when he says the sheep and the wolves and that whole thing, that you'll know them by their fruits. How do I know a sheep and a wolf? By their fruit, right? Are they bearing the fruit that was supposed to be born by God's people through these trees I prophesied about? Or are they not? If they're not, they're wolves, right? Luke 12, 32, it's in the same context that he's talking to, to folks here. And he says, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He calls the people that believe him. He calls the people that follow him into the, king, the national kingdom. And the people that repent and obey his commands, John 14, the little flock. The whole nation of Israel will not receive the kingdom. Jesus came to divide true and false Israel. He identifies true Israel as those branches that bear fruit because they're in him. He identifies true Israel as the little flock, right? This group of people who follow him, who believe him. He came to divide the faithful from the unfaithful. Israel is the sheep. Matthew 10, 6, Jesus came and chose 12 uh, disciples, 12 to be apostles, and sent them out, but he did not send them to Gentiles. He sent them though not to the Gentiles, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And those that rejected their message didn't come into the fold. Okay? The little flock was there. Jeremiah 50, 17 talks about Israel being scattered, it, the flock of Israel being scattered. And in Acts 8, verse 1, we find, and we studied in our verse by verse through Acts 8, that Saul, when Saul was consenting unto his death, when Israel stoned Stephen, rejected Jesus, and started killing their, uh, the apostles of the Lord, at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which is at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad. The little flock of Luke 12, 32 was scattered out of Jerusalem, right? The believing remnant, the small group, the root, the stub, what was left of Jesus cutting off the branches saying, you're all cursed, you didn't bear any fruit. What was left is called a remnant. When you have a big tree and you cut it down, what's left is a remnant. It's called the root, right? That's the remnant. And this remnant, this sheep, this little flock was scattered actually out of the city. This is where Hebrews comes in. Because this little flock's reading, this is what this is. And they're reading this book going, God, where's your salvation? We trust Jesus, right? We did what he said, and we're scattered out of the city. We're being persecuted by our brethren, right? And Hebrews saying, judgment will come. You need to endure. Wait for the rest. The rest of the Lord when he comes, right? In fiery judgment, and you will get the city you were promised. That's what Hebrews 13, 20 says. Hebrews is written to that people, right? <clears throat> the same people that Habakkuk is a part of now in the Old Testament. Let's go back to Habakkuk 3, verse 6, 17, then Habakkuk 3. All that found, and, and so much more, found in Habakkuk 3, verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, <clears throat> neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no herd in the stalls. What's Habakkuk saying? I will rejoice in the Lord. That's the right response. Even though they're scattered out of Jerusalem, right? They're not sitting and can't go to the temple anymore, right? The whole nation's persecuting them. Saul is slaughtering them, chasing them around the countryside. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That's what they say. That's what they're supposed to say, right? And they're to the end. <clears throat> it's interesting. 
you take that knowledge that we just studied through and you read through Romans 11 once again, and you'll find it should be obvious that the olive tree in Romans 11 is not talking about you. The church, the body of Christ, is never referred to as a tree, which refers to nations and earthly powers and dominions on this earth. We are a body of which currently the body, the head, is in heaven. We have heavenly places, right? Body parts are never cut off of Christ's body, but branches are. Because all these trees had to do with Israel and their covenants, their promises, their obligations, right? And so they're respecting fruit. God in this dispensation doesn't expect any fruit from anyone. He's all are under sin, right? And he gives graciously to all when we trust the gospel of his finished work. And so we receive all spiritual blessings in Christ. And so we're not called a little flock. We're not the vineyard, not the fig tree, not the olive tree. Never language Paul refers to us as in the church of the body of Christ. But his language you find all over Jesus' earthly ministry. Israel bore no fruit, and they were scattered. So Habakkuk says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet. This is like uh, deers, mountain goats, you know, the, the hooves, right? They have these hooves so that when they, they stand on the rocky places, the unstable places, they can stand firm. You know that, right? So that they have these feet, and you see these mountain goats and things, and, and deer and, and these animals who who walk on these crevices and crags and things, and they don't fall, amazingly. <laughs> but, I mean, they're designed that way. Uh, so they have a stable footing among unstable terrain, right? You don't have feet quite like that, um, but that's another story. Um, but this is what he's saying. You've made me stable in an unstable place. That's what Habakkuk's saying, right? I'll rejoice in the Lord. Now, there's a whole lesson we can teach on this. I don't have time to go through it, but I will briefly define for you the difference between joy and happiness, because I think it's appropriate. When Habakkuk says, I will rejoice in the Lord, I will join the God of my salvation, it, re it should remind you of Philippians, when Paul, in prison, not good circumstances, writes an epistle to the Philippians about joy. And he even says in every chapter, rejoice in the Lord, find your joy in the Lord, right? And the Philippians, no doubt, are thinking, how in the world, Paul? You're in prison. You're our apostle. Things are looking bad. How can we joy? And he says, join the Lord, right? There's a difference between joy and happiness, okay? Joy is what you take pleasure in. Happiness is the feel goods, is what I do. It's what happens to you that makes you feel good, right? And you know a lot of things that make you happy, right? Food that can make you happy or circumstances that make you happy and you know things that don't make you happy. These are things that happen to you, right? But joy is what you take pleasure in. This is something that your will, your conscience has to decide, okay? You can decide not to have joy in anything and life will be miserable. Or you can decide to find joy in something and you will find joy in that thing if that thing comes about or performs, right? Or happens or is expected to happen, Right? So you get to choose what to joy in. Kind of like when I say, what kind of food do you enjoy? Right? And you have decided in your mind what food to enjoy, right? Well, I, en I enjoy this type of food. That's what I like. You have made this choice. It doesn't just happen to you. People have the, these choices to make. Look, look at Colossians 1.11. This is really helpful because all throughout the scripture when it says rejoice in the Lord, um, this is what it's talking about. It's not saying, believe Jesus and you'll be happy every day. Um, no. <laughs> uh, trust the Lord, and every day is not going to be a holiday, right? As the song says, you know. But uh, in Colossians 1, you can joy in the Lord, and when you choose to do so, you will find the Lord is faithful. Colossians 1 11 says that we're, he prays that the Colossians will be strengthened with all might according to the glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. You see that? How in the world could I suffer for a long time and feel good? Well, you can't. That's a, that's, that's, you're looking for happiness. I mean, happiness is something that feels good. And if you're going to suffer for a long time, that's not good at all. Right? But he prays that they might have such a spiritual understanding, verse 9 and 10, and be so strengthened by God's might in their inner man that when bad circumstances happen, they will have patience and long suffering with joyfulness because they've decided what to set their affections on. Right? And saying, I value what, what I enjoy 
is the Lord and seeing his will done. What I enjoy is what Christ has done. What I enjoy is seeing his understanding come to fruition in me. That's what I enjoy, right? So then when you have bad things happen to you, you're not judging your joy by the circumstances, but you're saying, what is it I enjoy? I enjoy God's will being done and his word working in me. And his word says that I'm complete in Christ. I have all spiritual blessings. His word says I'm at peace with God. His words say, say I have a hope of glory. And I enjoy those things. And I have those things apart from what you do to me. You say, and so Paul can write Philippians. Put me in prison. So what? You haven't taken away my joy, right? Because his joy is in the Lord. It's not in the circumstances or any fruit of his hands, right? And Colossians 1.11 talks about this. Look, look at uh, Colossians 3 verse 2. Paul commands them. He says, if you've been ris risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Because listen, folks, if you seek the things that aren't above, you may or may not be disappointed. Now, some of you are going, I've had a pretty good life. Well, fine. This is circumstantial, however, Right? You may not have had a good life or a good day or a good hour or whatever have you. He says, set your affections on things above. Seek those things that are above, not on things in the earth. When you set your affections on Christ, on the things that are above, and there's a list of those things you can do, for every earthly thing that people have their affection on, there's a, 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 a heavenly equivalent. And when you do that, then you won't be disappointed when the things of this earth don't come to pass. That's not where, where your joy is set, Right? Look at Galatians 5.24. Galatians 5.24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You see? If your flesh decides what you enjoy, then you will be disappointed. Right? You'll say, well, my spiritual life is really... Not very well. Well, no, no, no. You're living according to your flesh. That's why things aren't going well. If you crucified the affections and lusts of your flesh and set your affections on the Lord, then the fruit you will have of the Spirit is what? It says in the context, joy, long-suffering. You see, it'll happen automatically because when you set your affections on Christ, long-suffering just occurs because, uh, yeah, I, 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 that's not what I value most. I value that, right? And long-suffering will occur naturally, the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Joy will occur. You start to enjoy things. You start to enjoy when people come to a knowledge of the truth. You start to enjoy when you see an opportunity to use the truth that you know. You'll start to enjoy when you see God's truth being preached and teached. You enjoy that, right? Or you can decide not to. It's your choice. But when you sow to the Spirit, you reap of the Spirit. You sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. Paul says to Thessalonians, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. Thessalonians, you're like us. I mean, you received the word, you went out and did some work, and people just opposed you left and right. And he says, you received the word in much affliction with joy. Well, what? I mean, I thought joy would be like, I could enter ministry and do ministry work. I could see a lot of people responding, you know. That's good. Yes, it would be good. But it says here, they suffered much affliction with joy. But where was their joy? in the Holy Ghost. Their joy wasn't in whether or not the people afflicted them or not. The joy was in the Holy Ghost. So you're in samples to all of us because you suffered affliction, but your joy was in God, not in your circumstances, and thus you're an example to everyone. Right? That's what he says. Philippians 2.2, 2, he says, Rejoice in the Lord. Or Philippians, uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. We'll cover this in a few weeks. I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I have ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. What Paul considers a joy, he wants to be their joy so they can have mutual joy together in the Lord. That's what he's saying. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 3. Look at Romans 15 verse 13. And we'll near the end here, Romans 15 13. Are you without hope? <laughs> Do you want some hope? Do you know where hope comes from? Hope in the scripture? When you're in a hopeless situation, what does this mean? You're in dire straits, right? You're, you're in a situation where you think there is no light at the end of the tunnel, right? You're anxious, you're maybe fearful. Um, this is what a hopeless situation is. 
Do you want hope? Well, if you take some patience and you add some joy, you get some hope. All right? The question is, why should I be patient and how do I get the joy? <laughs> right? But if you take patience and joy in that situation, dark, depressed, right? And I have joy and patience. That's what hope is. Right? Romans 15, verse 13. It's the light at the end of the tunnel. Light at the end of the tunnel. Right? Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope, he is a God of hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. Let, the God, let God fill you with patience and joy. How? In believing. You believe God's word. He'll teach you patience and joy and give you the hope of glory. Right? Hope. That's how that works. So that's what Paul's saying there. That's the way that works. And so you see joy here uh, being a necessary component of, of what it means to be a Christian, of a believer in God, when God has spoken things to them. You see it in Habakkuk when he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord after God told him what he was going to do. Habakkuk believes. He needed to wait. He enjoys in the Lord, and thus he has hope. Right? So Habakkuk says, he says, the Lord God is my strength. Not his own works, because God told him the just shall live by faith. The Lord God is my strength, which is a spiritual truth for all of us, I believe. Paul says this. Jesus tells him, my grace is sufficient, right? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. It's not about the all things you can do. It's about Christ's strength that you need, right? And this is why Habakkuk ends the book with that. I will rejoice in the Lord. The joy, uh, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Salvation hasn't come yet, you understand. But he's believed it, he's heard it, he's believed it, and he's waiting for it. And he enjoys the salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And so he makes him stable in the unstable situation. You see that? All right. That's the end of Habakkuk. Any comments, any questions about Habakkuk? It's fun stuff, isn't it? It's fun. Amen. All right. Lord, we thank you for the, the hope of glory you've given us through Christ. And you give it to us freely. I pray that we would believe. And as you promise, your word will work, work effectually in us. As we believe your word. Not just acknowledge it, but truly believe it to, to be something that will occur in us. You promise to give us joy and peace and love and long-suffering and salvation. Which you've given us all freely by your grace, Lord. We thank you for Habakkuk and the, the, the book you've inspired and preserved for us to study. And I pray that as we study 2 Corinthians in the future, that we would grow thereby being members of your body. Amen.